a certifiable dirtbag, stole millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And he's found guilty. But you and I know there's a high likelihood he'll buy his way out at the next level. That's the problem. And now you understand why there's such dissension in this country. When you're poor, you don't stand a chance. When you're rich, you stand a very good chance. Back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O. We're talking about a lot of different topics. Let's go to the callers who have a lot to say about these things. Joe on WFTL, welcome to the Savage Nation. Thank you, Dr. Savage. I really take to heart what you said about people wearing their religion on their sleeve. I grew up in a very religious environment and broke away pretty much intellectually completely in college where I seized being in a uh, Jewish religious educational universe. And um, it almost seems like the very, very religious, there, there's some type of neurotic, psychotic type of element to the behavior. Well, I can't overgeneralize and say that everyone who is, over, uh, let's say, super religious in any religion is something wrong with them or doing it for, for nefarious purposes. I'm just saying in the case of Sheldon Silver, it's clear to me that he was using his religion as a weapon. I think I think there are endless cases of that, and you know, when I grew up very religious and with very religious people all around me, and exposure to no other intellectual or religious streams of, of consciousness, to be to be honest with yourself, you have to be able to also realize that there are other world viewpoints, and we are sort of spokes in a wheel. And people that are very belligerent about their beliefs, no matter what, no matter what the beliefs are, seem to all harbor some internal need to do that beyond what the religion itself seems to, to dictate. That's right. In other words, the religion itself should dictate do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But when they practice the religion, whatever it may be, to the exclusion of all other religions, they're going against their own religious religious tenets. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the first the first counter-religious philosophy that I learned about in college was existentialism, which I think has its own issues. I think they're in a sort of nihilistic... Okay, de describe for the audience what existentialism is, because you were exposed to liberal liberal teachings, as I was, and then you turned away from your own religion. What is it that you found appealing about existentialism? The appealing thing about existentialism to me was the very intellectual, honest statement that there is simply freedom and responsibility and that man must be able to fill the void with something. And man seems to have his biggest conundrum when he's unable to fill that void. Of course, religion is a great way to fill that void. Are, are, so how do you, as a former religious person, fill that void now that you no longer believe in God? I became a medical doctor, and I'm busy all day saving people and helping them with their problems. So I don't have to think about my own. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's a very good answer. I, I get a kick out of reality because, you know, there's a tenet in the religion, the Jewish religion that, that's a great one. There are many, but this one I always remember, which is he who saves a single life, it is as though he has saved the entire world. So in a, in a, in a sense, you're acting out that tenet of your own religion as well as many others. That's right. And, you know, with so many people on the planet really doing nothing all day but trying to figure out how to blow up other people, it's nice to be in a job where all day we, we, we deal with little millimeters of arteries and veins and, and, and spend hours trying to save one little person. You know? So Why is it that radical Islamists spend their every waking minute thinking about how to destroy human beings instead of save them? While. Jewish people, on the other hand, are well known for saving lives. What is it about their religion itself that drives people down that road? This is the, the, the part that bothers me the most. How is it that every time there's a suicide bomber, every time there's a terrorist incident, they hold up their holy book and they say they're doing it in the name of Allah? What is it about that holy book that impels them to kill and murder and maim? That's what I want to know. And until people ask themselves that question, they're never going to find the answer. 
Well, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think it's beyond the religion. I think there's some racial genetic mechanism in there also. And uh, I think it just goes back to the desert and the law of the tribes and uh, every brother versus his brother and biblical tales of, of vengeance against the entire lineage of another family because they insulted your honor. And it's just that's just part of that culture. It is a culture of survival, of violence, of, of murder and of death. And, you know, one could be very objective and say... So why, why then is, why is Hussein Obama inflicting hundreds of thousands of Muslims on this nation? Why? You know and I know that amongst them there are going to be fanatics who will cause harm. Why would he do this to us? So I, I, I agree with what you say. He's either very naive and stupid or he's a plant. So let's, let's forget about him being a plant for a second, in which case he'd want to bring them all in here just to kill us. But if he's very naive and stupid, then maybe he thinks after two or three generations they'll all buy a big screen TV and sit around all day and eat popcorn and get into football, and then he can use the American culture to breathe the craziness out of them. Well, I would think that there are those kinds of, uh, that kind of thinking in the sorority around him. That's classic liberalism which is that if you show them the way, they will follow the way because humans are inherently good. I don't happen to see that as a truth. I don't think humans are inherently good or bad. I think humans are inherently human, and they're capable of becoming good or bad depending upon their upbringing. And if you're teaching them hatred from the cradle to the grave, they're going to wind up hating and killing. It's that simple. Of course, but you know we have to be very fair, and there have been some very good... Muslim doctors, and there is a recent case where a, a Jewish guy was lost in the West Bank in a town, and an Arab guy brought him into his house and saved him from a lynch mob. So, you know, again, we can't generalize. I mean, there's a. I saw that. I saw that on YouTube, by the way. It's an amazing story that the, the Palestinian came out and pulled him into his house at great risk to himself. I wonder what happened to that Palestinian after the cameras left. Who knows? Who knows? So what kind, of, what kind of medicine do you practice that you have the time to call a radio talk show in the middle of the afternoon? <laughs> I'm a cardiologist, but I specialize in uh, pictures of the heart. So uh, it's more of a nine-to-five job. Well, we can talk about that en endlessly, as I've done with my cardiologist. Thus far, I've been very lucky because I come from a family of early death from coronary artery disease. And uh, so far, I haven't been afflicted for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that I was obsessed with nutrition, vitamins, herbs for, for, for decades. But I found that only in the last five years that I also have a very, very unusual inheritance in the terms of the LPA. I think it's genetic. There's no question in my mind. You know, you know what the lipoprotein A is, right? Of course, of course. Yeah, well, it's one of the rare lipids that cannot be controlled by medication nor by vitamins or diet it is what it is based upon your genes and i guess i got that from my mother's side and it explains why despite my uh the level of stress that i lived through despite the fact that i have really violated every dietary protocol i ever wrote about at times and that i lead the highest stress life of anyone in the history of my family that, I, that i'm still walking the planet and i think it's this genetic factor to be honest with you have you ever had a calcium score? I did. I had one of the first calcium scores ever done. Oh, what a story that is. It was 15 years ago. And I remember getting off the bed, and the nurse came over, and she said to me, I don't know, she looked at me, and I didn't know whether it was good or bad. I thought she was going to find chalk inside my arteries. She said, you have the arteries of a 20-year-old. I jumped off the uh, gurney, and I hugged her, and I danced around that room because I realized then and there that somebody up there likes me. Doctor, thank you very much for calling the Savage Nation. I'll be back in a moment. So I go back to this article, this hit piece, by uh, uh, back in the USSR, how today's Russia is like the Soviet era. They try to put a hit piece on it. So they start with the anthem, then the party. There's no parties other than the Communist Party. And I say, oh, yeah, well, substitute the Democrat Party and see, see if that doesn't apply here in America. Now we go to spies. Here's what they write. By the mid-2000s, up to 80% of the Russian ruling establishment was made up of people with backgrounds in security services, according to a study. The trend was confirmed in numerous subsequent studies. Above all, this included the Soviet secret police, the KGB, which handled counter-espionage and brutally suppressed political dissent. Okay, that's real. Now, 
The KGB successor to the Fe the Federal Security Service, the FSB, okay, FSB, if you watch Homeland, that's the FSB, is now both powerful and feared. It is tasked with fighting spies and extremists, but it also monitors the political opposition to the government. Now, question. Uh, FBI in America, CIA in America, DIA in America, or uh, DHS in America, don't you think that they're both powerful and feared? And don't you think they're tasked with fighting not only spies and extremists, but also the American people themselves? Don't you think these organizations in America also monitor the political opposition to Obama's socialist government? Well, of course they do. So what's the difference between the Soviet Union and the USA in this regard? Very little. Dissidents. Now listen to this, what they write, trying to hit, uh, again, uh, Putin. They write this. Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union's fear leader who ran the country with an iron fist from 24 to 53, purged in prison and executed his critics. Even in post-Stalin times, the regime punished those who threatened or disagreed with it. So dissidents were fired, jailed, expelled, confined to psychiatric wards, and harassed by the KGB. That's all true. I read my soldier Nietzsche. But what does that have to do with Putin? They don't do that anymore. They say Russia's opposition today also fights an asymmetric battle. Its leaders face criminal cases and regular arrests. Thugs harass them at events, and officials drown them in red tape. I said, really? Now let's look at America. Let's see what the Obama opposition faces. Let's see. Do the opposition, the opponents of Obama face criminal cases? Oh, yeah. How about that bakery case? How about all of the people who were punished by the illegal, illegitimate, fascistic IRS or the EPA? Then it says that in Russia, thugs harass opposition leaders at events. Are you telling me that conservatives are not harassed at every event by government thugs or by thugs in America who are working for the government, such as Black Lives Matter, like the National Action Network under Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson thugs? Are you telling me that they're not thugs who are fundamentally working with and for the government? And then they finish by saying, and officials in Russia drown their opponents in red tape. Oh, really? The IRS and the EPA don't do that in our in our country? Okay, now let's go down the list. I'm, I'm deconstructing this for you. This is a very important thing for you to understand. So NBC and their attempt to continue to smear Putin are trying to say it's like the Soviet Union, but they can't do it. Moreover, everything they say about Russia applies to America under Obama. I'll read you another one. Media control. Soviet media broadcast only what officials wanted it to. And access to foreign media was banned. In the 2000s, one of Putin's first moves was to bring back under state control the leading television channels, Russia's main source of information. They have since turned into pro-government vehicles. I'm going to ask you straight out. Are you telling me that Jake Tapwater, Wolf Blitzer, any of the other clowns on ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, or even Fox News. Are you telling me then they're not exactly like state-controlled media? Tell me how they differ. Tell me that they're not pro-government vehicles. And then they go on and they undermine their own argument. They say, nevertheless, Russia has many independent small media outlets that offer alternative points of view. Now, because of the Internet cable and the accessibility of international print media, Russians can get their hands on a wide variety of organizations. And so what's their point? So there is no overt media control like in the Soviet Union. Now we get down to the meat of what they're really getting to here. Are you ready for this? Let's go to the bottom of this hit piece. Here it comes. This is the mother of all lies. Homophobia. In Soviet times, sodomy, quote-unquote, was punished with up to five years in prison. In Putin's Russia, quote, promotion of homosexuality, unquote, to minors carries fines and arrests, and public displays of same-sex affection or transgender behavior can result in public abuse. Now they undermine themselves. But homosexuality is not a crime anymore. Even if some people are intolerant of it, and public figures often speak out against it. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. The fact of the matter is, you know and I know, there are no dangers for people of different sexual orientations in Russia. You know that as well as I. But you also know that there's a war against Putin for